Hello, everyone. My name is Todd Enoch, and I am the head of Serials and Electronic Resources at the University of North Texas Libraries. And on behalf of the NACIG Continuing Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, webinar, Streamline Your Negotiation, Creating and Updating a License Template for Your Institution, presented by Leanne Taylor. Before I hand it over to Leanne, a few quick announcements. First of all, this session will be recorded and a copy of the recording will be made available to everyone who registered. Secondly, if you have any questions for Leanne during the presentation, please enter them into the Q&A box in WebEx and not in the chat function. At the end of the presentation, Leanne will try to answer as many as she can, time permitting. Uh, next, we do have a few upcoming webinars which we'll talk about more at the end of the presentation, but I wanted to draw your attention to the joint NASIG NISA webinar on May 21st, playing the numbers, best practices in acquiring, interpreting, and applying usage statistics. That is a, something that we're doing with NISO. It's the first time we're doing a joint uh, webinar with them. And it is hosted by NISO, so if you're interested in registering, you'll need to go to the NISO webpage. And finally, when you log off from the webinar today, you will be redirected to a SurveyMonkey survey. Please take a few minutes to fill that out. Let us know how we're doing, what we can do better, ideas for future webinars, anything you can do to help us make these better for you. And with that, let me go ahead and introduce our speaker for the day. Leanne Taylor has been negotiating licenses within libraries since 2005. She has served as a continuing resources librarian at Texas State University since 2009 and also currently serves as the interim head of acquisition. During her tenure, she has negotiated several major system-wide licenses with major publishers, created an institutional license template, and began work on new standardized language not currently found in model licenses. She has developed a website that enables librarians to compare clauses in model licenses. And with that, I will now turn things over to Leanne. All right. Thank you, Todd. I appreciate that introduction and welcome, everyone. Um, to streamline your negotiation, creating and updating a license template for your institution. Let's go ahead and get started. So as you heard a little bit about me, about nine years of experience negotiating licenses, I learned like everybody else learned, trial by fire. Um, I was made a serials librarian, I got a license, and then I had to learn how to do it. I did take the Center for Intellectual Property Advanced Licensing course that was taught by Tricia Davis back in 2011. Uh, CIP is no longer around, so it's not something you could take, but it was very useful. Um, a little bit about where I work. I work at a state university in Texas. We're a public institution. We're pretty large. We have almost 30,000 FTE. We're an emerging research institution, which means that our focus is now on supporting research um, and developing research initiatives, and we're the flagship institution of a system of about five schools. So I uh, negotiate licenses on behalf of, of our group with, with major publishers. So today we're going to talk about how you can create or update license guidelines without reinventing the wheel. Um, We'll look at our model licenses that we have in the industry, what they're about, where they're going. And then we'll talk about where there are gaps and where we see the new normal, where exceptions have become the rule when we get our licenses. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about how we can work together and move forward as a licensing community. So why create license guidelines and what are they? I like to think of them as my favorite recipes. For instance, it took me years to figure out how to make lasagna that I really found edible. And once I figured it out, I wrote it down so I could always go back and do it the exact same way again. License guidelines are just like that. They allow you to stop hunting for that wording you used once in that one license, and now you need to use it again. It allows you to have consistent verbiage across all of your license agreements. It allows you to share with colleagues what your licensing standards are, and also with administrators if they ask. And you can also use your guidelines as a checklist as you review new licenses to make sure that they include everything that you need and they're spelled out in the way that you want them to be spelled out. It sounds a little daunting, but I want to assure you the wheel has been invented. You are not starting this from scratch. And I'm going to lead you through what I think is a really easy process to develop a license template or license guidelines at your institution or update your existing ones. So first. You need to stop and you need to think about how you work. 
who will need access to these guidelines and what actually is the purpose of them. So are you licensing alone? And so you don't really need to share these guidelines with anyone. Do you want to use it really just as a checklist, just to make sure that the license that you're reviewing has standard phrases in it? Or do you need something that you can easily copy and paste from because you're going to be negotiating a lot within Word documents or within email? Think about how often you might need to update your guidelines, especially in the beginning, and if that's something that you need to consider when you're creating a guideline, a guideline template. Um, think about how you like to search for information. Do you like to do keyword searching? Are you more of a browser? You need to think about things as you start considering the format options. Now, I know that we love spreadsheets. We, we overuse spreadsheets in our, in our field, especially librarians who do serials and licensing and e-resources. And frankly, my license template guideline is in a spreadsheet. I do think, though, that there are other options that are possibly even better. PowerPoint. This is something I don't think we use enough. You could actually use a PowerPoint to store your standard guidelines. Think about it. Each slide could represent a different section within a license. You can easily search through a PowerPoint because you have Control F, which works, in, or for Mac users, you have something similar, um, which works for finding keywords. You have note fields. You can easily copy and paste. You could actually create your license guidelines as a PowerPoint. Um, for those of you who attended NAFID 2012, Debera England from Wright State University came up with a really interesting idea of using ERM records to store license guidelines and license verbiage that she likes to use at her institution. She was going on a leave of absence. She was trying to figure out how can she put all of this information in a place where people who would be doing her job would be able to find. And she created these administrative ERM records. They use III over there. And they were searchable and you could copy and paste. It was very creative and uh, you could read about it in the NASIC proceedings or you could contact a bear. I'm sure she'd be happy to tell you all about it. You could think about going really low tech. You can create a Word document with headings. So each section in a license, let's say authorized users or indemnification, could be, could be created as a heading. In Word, you can actually view those headings as navigation and click, like going to different sections in your Word document. Very easy to use. Or you could create a Google document, also very easy to use. A lot of folks like some of the new Note apps. Um, Evernote is great. There's different tabs in Evernote. Simple Note is great. It's accessible from a lot of different devices. Wikis are still alive, and they still have a purpose. If multiple people are going to be developing guidelines or making notes, um, it could be a really useful way to have a shared template or guideline set. You could think about creating a basic web page, and I'll show you an example of a Google site, very easy to create with a Google account, allows you to have browsability, allows you to have keyword searching, um, allows for easy copy and paste. It also is something that you could give certain people permission to edit and other people view only. So you could share the link, not everybody could update it, only certain people could, which could help you control a little bit. Uh, we're always concerned about things being deleted. Um, I'm going to throw in the idea of an access database because it feels like I need to say that, although like most people I haven't really utilized it in the way that I could, but I, I'm sure there is a way that you could create a template um, in an access database. And you also want to think about where you're going to save it, especially if you're going to need to share it. So um, are you going to save it on your computer? Are you going to store it maybe in Dropbox or on SharePoint or within Google? And think about how the different file formats might work with those different, um, those different storage tools. So you really need to start by thinking about how you work, who's going to use it, how you want to use it, and then think a little bit outside the box beyond the spreadsheet. You can start, of course, with one format, and you can always transition to another. So after you've kind of thought a little bit about this, I recommend that you go to my website. I have a tiny URL up there on the screen, and I've created a license guidelines template for you to download. Of course, it's in an Excel spreadsheet. You can convert this later. You'll notice on the left-hand side, I've listed the sections that you commonly find in licenses. So when you get a license, you're more often than not will see these sections represented. And there are also sections that you might want to have customized language for your institution. So that gives you a good sense of what you might need to create in terms of customized language. I recommend that for whatever kind of guideline you create, you have something that allows you to know a little bit about the use status for each field. For instance, you may not ever really negotiate for invalidity or for notices. It just might not be something that's particularly important to your institution. 
but there might be some sections within license you always need to look at. If you have specific regulations from the state that says you have to have certain language in there, you might want to indicate that. And it's very helpful if you can go through your guidelines template and make sure you've hit all your always or all the ones that you actively negotiate. You might also want a status for pending, for those areas where you're still working out the language, you're not sure what you want to do, and so you can filter for what you're still working on. I also include a, a column here for notes. So I like to put a lot of institutional history, some context, what my goals are when I'm negotiating, here's what I'm aiming to do, as a reminder of, of why that area or that section is important. And then lastly, and this is the really important part, the preferred language. What is that language that you've decided you want to always have in your license agreements um, or licenses um, that have sp specific uses? When do you need to use that language? You have it right there. Um, that's really the primary goal, is to be able to have preferred language that you could copy, paste, or make sure is right within the license agreement that you're reviewing. So you've considered your, your format, you've considered your needs, You've downloaded these guidelines, now what? Oh, this is an example of what my license guidelines actually looks like. So the section is authorized user. Um, the use status, actively negotiate, I always negotiate that. The comment section has my notes and when I might make exceptions. Um, and then the sample language has my preferred language. So that's what it looks like in my world. Yours might look different. Okay. So your next step, you're going to take that template that you downloaded and you're going to start converting it to your choice of format, whether that's an ERM record or a wiki or a Google website. And you're going to start filling it in. And I encourage you to start by filling it in with known institutional specific needs or go out and discover what those might be. For instance, a couple years ago, I randomly found out that our IT division, when they negotiate for software, they have language that they always use. They have preferred language for those license agreements. That was given to me, and I included those then and tried to use those, when, use those whenever possible within our license agreements for the library. Also, if you're a state institution, there may be state laws. For instance, in Texas, we cannot indemnify our licensors. We have to make sure that we strike that or we have a certain clause that says uh, that we can't do that. Um, so if you don't know what those state laws are, you might want to reach out to other institutions within your state to see if they know and you can get on the same page. So you really want to look inside first. Look at your library history, look at your division, look at the state, and see if you have any institution-specific needs, regulations, or wording already in place. But you're still going to have a lot of gaps. So the next thing that I recommend you do when you're trying to find preferred language and come up with standards is you look at these model licenses that we have in the field. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can best do that. But before we do that, I want to talk about what these model licenses are, because you might not be familiar with all of them, and there's actually a lot of updates. So the first I want to talk about is called Live License. Now, you might be familiar with Live License because it's still a listserv. It's also a website. It was developed back in 1997 by Ann Oakleson, uh, back when she was at NERL, the Northeast Research Libraries Group. And um, they developed and had many drafts of a model license that academic libraries could use to see what standard language they could use or to give to vendors who maybe did not have a license. The last revision of Live License was back in 2008. And Ann has now moved Live License over to uh, the Center for Research Libraries. And she sent out a, a message, you might have seen it a couple weeks back, that indicated that updates be, are, be, began in fall 2013 to update the live license model license. They received some support from the Mellon Foundation. And a group of people are working on this, and they expect a draft to be out for review in mid-2014. This is really big news. This is very exciting. This is going to be um, one of the best new model licenses we're going to have in the field, and we're going to have the opportunity to let that group know what might be missing or what we think um, is great or what doesn't work. In addition to this model license, they're also updating software that they had created, and I never used it. 
that supposedly will assist you in building license agreements. It will kind of combine the model license and it will serve as a tool so you can actually build an agreement. Now, I don't really know what that's going to look like. And it will come out later in 2014, but I'm very, very excited to see what it could do. Uh, if you want to see Anne's announcement, it is on the CRL website. You can Google it or you can check some of the listers. She posted it there as well. Um, so other model licenses that we have in the field. Um, before Anne left NERL, um, they revised their model license uh, in November 2012. It's very strong. It's wonderful. It's pretty recent, so it has a lot of the new concerns. Additionally, there's something called licensing models. It was developed by uh, the consultant John Cox in, in conjunction with Tricia Davis, who um, had taught the advanced licensing course for CIT. She's retired now from Ohio State University, but they worked together with vendors to create some model licenses. Unfortunately, those were last revised in 2009, and I haven't had good luck in contacting John's daughter, Laura, in figuring out and finding out what they're going to be doing in the future, so I'm not sure what the status is with that, but still, it still has some pretty good clauses that are very useful uh, to review. And then, of course, the California Digital Library is um, the system for UC schools. They last revised their their guidelines and their checklist in 2011. I reached out to them, and it sounds like they're actually going to be updating again this year. So that's very exciting. And then the Florida Virtual Campus did a huge revision of, of their guidelines, the sample clauses, uh, in 2013. And Claire Divert gave a presentation about that at NASIG last year. And she's giving a pre-conference this year at NASIG. Um, she's a wonderful expert about that whole revision process. So that set of guidelines is very useful. So when I look at this, I think the, the old live license from 2008 is probably too old for us to use right now. But those bottom four, the NERL licensing models, the California Digital Library, and the Florida Virtual Campus model licenses are great. And they're so useful. But it's cumbersome to have four license agreements out at once when you're trying to develop the terms. So I created this website with the URL you can see, tinyurl.com forward slash compare licenses. And what I've done is I've broken down each of those four model licenses by, by the sections within them. And I've allowed you to compare what each license has for that section. So this also gives you a good idea of what a Google site might look like. So you notice at the upper right, you can search the site. So keyword fair use. Or if you're more of a browser, you can create um, navigation on the left side. Actually, you could put that navigation anywhere. And you can click and, and browse through. So this, this isn't legal advice. This is just a way to make it easier for, for us to learn from those model licenses and quickly compare what the options are for preferred language. So again, we have the CDL, the FLVC, licensing models, and NERL. And as these get updated, I intend to update this site so that we can always have the most recent language from the model licenses. Here's what a section looks like. So this is the section on amendment, and it's one of those where each of the four actually has their own wording for it. So you can see that you can very easily glance and see what each license has to say, where they differ, what the guidelines are. And then you can copy, you can paste, you can adopt, you can adapt. Um, according to your own needs. Or if you're reviewing a license, you can see if their terms that you're reviewing match anything in any of the model licenses and start doing some analysis there to see if what you're reading is tenable. So I really hope that that's useful. And, I, and I've used it, and I'm really glad I created it, and it was worth all the work that I did. Um, and I really feel that if you start with your institutional priorities, what you know about um, locally, you go to these model licenses, you're going to have a lot of really great verbiage. You will not have to recreate the wheel. However, we are in a new world where we are seeing more bizarre <laughs> um, cases in our license agreements and new acquisition models and new issues. And so as you build your guidelines, you might have to find wording that's not in those model licenses. You might have to, in some cases, start from scratch. And I think this is where I, I really feel we as librarians need to work together a little bit more as a community to deal with these exceptions. And we need to think about these issues when we see the new live license template uh, model license and say, could the model license be improved to include 
these new exceptions that have become the rule. So what am I talking about here? Um, this is a long list, and I'm not going to review all of these in detail um, for the rest of the webinar, but I'm talking about things like text and data mining, about um, whether or not we should require discovery service participation in our licenses. I'm talking about new kinds of access models and acquisition models and formats. So getting into the world of streaming video, especially self-hosting, um, licensing data sets that maybe don't come on a CD but that you download from the web, um, looking at e-reserve pauses and e-books. And then we still have a lot of unsolved problems that weren't solved by our model licenses. We have problems in auto renewal. We continue to have problems with um, having strength or I should say strong perpetual access clauses. We're having a lot of difficulty with fair use and reasonable use. Um, we're seeing an increased use of EULAs, which stands for end user license agreements, or you might call them click-through agreements, where our vendors, we go through all this effort negotiating the site license, and yet our individual patrons have their own click-through agreement that says something completely different. And we're also seeing an increased attention to ADA um, accessibility compliance from lawsuits and from just local um, attention that's been brought to this issue. So there's a lot of places where our model licenses might not be able to help you right now. And you might need to create your own language. And so I hope that we can work together as a community. I hope what I'm about to say is going to help. And I hope that um, when we see the new draft of the live license, model license, that we can start including these. So let's talk about some of these issues. The first is text and data mining, and this has gotten a lot of press in our conferences over the past few years. Um, I think it's kind of been an issue since maybe 2010, 2011, it's hit the mainstream. If you don't know a lot about what that means, I do encourage you to check out those two uh, bullet points I have under background. The first is a, a really nifty PowerPoint presentation with audio that you can, click, you can click through very quickly and go to the slides that you're interested in and hear the audio. Um, and you can get a really good background on how, why researchers want to do text and data mining and what the situation is. And even though it's from 2011, it's still quite relevant. And also, and also Spark through ARL, um, Scholarly Publishers and uh, Academic Resource Coalition, um, has written a new statement about um, some developments in text and data mining. And at the beginning of it, they give you a background of text and data mining. And I think it's really helpful if you're new to it. But basically, in short, we have researchers who are dealing with a lot of information, let's say thousands of articles, and they want to apply computing technology and computational analysis to draw out patterns, to organize all the information across all those articles, to to, to really even apply metadata to some of those articles. And so rather than reading 30,000 articles, marking them up and talking about it, can we apply uh, computational analysis tools to better draw out patterns? And that's really what text and data mining is all about. So do we have standard language? Sort of. Um, the International Association of STM Publishers um, really wonderful group, really has a lot of information about uh, this issue, has created some sample license text. Now, I don't include it here because it's three pages long. And <laughs> there are a lot of options. You could say this or you could say this. And so I feel like it's very useful, but um, we might need a little bit more help in figuring out really how we would want to use it. And we certainly need to know a little bit more about each of our own individual institutions to see if it would work. Also, Ann Okerson has said that that new live license, model license that's coming out will include TDM language. So we're about to see what that might look like um, adapted perhaps into um, one of our model licenses, and that's very exciting. But there's other developments. Elsevier, at the end of January of this year, has announced a new policy. And whereas before individual researchers had to negotiate one-on-one -on -one with Elsevier to do text and data mining, now if your institution has an Elsevier license, you can either, either add an addendum or when you're renegotiating, you can have a new clause that allows for text and data mining. Um, if you want to read more about it, I encourage you to read the announcement there that I have listed. You could just Google some of those words and you would come up with it because that URL is pretty long. So that sounds promising. Right, but of course there, there are some problems. So um, Spark has actually written a really great um, informational site about this Elsevier position and, and the new uh, clauses. So again, it gives you a good history of text and data mining, but then it 
talk specifically about Elsevier. And they bring up four issues with Elsevier's new standard language that you will find in Elsevier licenses or in the amendment. And they're very important. The first is that if you're dealing with a multi-institutional research team, so maybe there's a research from your institution and a research from another institution, each institution represented in that group needs to have a text and data mining clause in their license. So if each institution has a different, different clause, maybe they've negotiated it differently, there's a lot of work to make sure, okay, um, we've all at least negotiated for this use in this way. Um, or that we all have the standard clause. So there's a, a little bit of an obligation there. Um, it does require the use of the ScienceDirect API. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do data mining, but ScienceDirect, but Elsevier says, but you have to use our, our API tool in order to do it. And that might not work for all of the researchers at your institution. Um, also, it's only for text mining, so if your researchers are doing any kind of image mining, it does not apply. And also, it does require researchers to agree to a non-commercial license, which you might know the Creative Commons um, CCBYNC license, which, allow, which basically says that anyone who, that you publish your research, anyone can, sh you can share it, and they can further adapt it and transform it. And the people who are doing the text and data mining, when they put out their information, might not want others to share and adapt what they're doing. So the standard Elsevier clause might not work for you, and we might, as a group, not love it and want to put it without thinking in our licenses or add it to our Elsevier licenses. The other problem we have is that when our researchers are doing text and data mining, they're not just doing it across maybe one publisher, right? They're not just doing Elsevier or just doing Sage. Um, they probably want to work across a, a, a multi-publishers, a diversity of publishers. And that really makes licensing tricky on us because we would have to go back and go back to all those licenses. So very interestingly, Crossref recently announced their prospect tool. And I'm going to admit, I have trouble explaining it and getting my, my mind around it. The URL is there, and I'm going to do the best I can. But basically, here's the idea. Crossref recognizes Researchers can't negotiate individually the rights to do text and data mining with publishers. Publishers don't want to work with individual researchers. So Crossref really developed a tool that allows uh, publishers to include their uh, terms and conditions for text and data mining as metadata, really, um, within Crossref. Researchers can use, um, can use Crossref then to identify publishers that have these terms and can click through after they've proven that they're legitimate users and get the rights to do text and data mining. Now, I might be oversimplifying it and might have gotten some of the details wrong, but the general idea is they wouldn't have to go through the library to get those rights negotiated, and they wouldn't have to negotiate one-on-one -on -one with the publishers. If enough publishers participate, then they're going to be able to just click through and get that, that permission through Crossref. So that might mean that we won't have such an onus or such an obligation to include text and data mining clauses within all of our licenses, because the Crossref prospect might actually serve um, as a way for our researchers to get, to get those rights. So I think that's very interesting. If you want to know more, I do recommend you go to the Cross, Crossref prospect site. I have the URL there, but it's also very easily Googleable. So text and data mining, that's an area that's development. We need standard language. We don't know a lot about it. OK. It ties into an issue we're also seeing on campus for commercialization centers. So if you just Google Office of Commercialization and you limit your search to university websites, EDUs, you will see that tons of universities now have offices of commercialization. They might also call them incubator support services or tech transfer or knowledge transfer. The idea of any of these groups is to transform um, research into business opportunities or to commercialize research. And in the case of places that are incubators, they might actually be providing an office space for research teams to translate their, their research group into a startup company, and they're given office space, and they're given tools. Here's the problem. We know that our license agreements don't allow for commercial use. 
This is clearly commercial use. And so right now on our campuses, we might have people who are using our databases to support a commercialization project. And it might be the case that on some of these research campuses that might be separate from your main campus, that IP range still falls within your campus's IP range. So they're not being blocked out, they're going to be proxied through. Oh, and certainly in faculty's own offices, they'll be proxied through. We see this popping up in areas of chemistry, engineering, applied research, and we're having difficulty, I think, with publishers trying to negotiate rights for these kinds of offices and initiatives on our campus because they're clearly commercial and our licenses are clearly for non-commercial use. If you're interested in this, um, Ya Lee from University of Michigan, who has a background in chemistry and is now a librarian, presented about it in a webinar um, in March that I put up there on the, on the screen. And you can go, you can Google that, you can go to Bright Talk, you just have to register, it's free and you can watch the recording. Her presentation starts at slide 33, and it really gives you a good idea of the challenges of supporting applied research and maybe some of the licensing concerns. And I talked to you um, a couple days ago, and we talked a little bit about this and her experience. And one of the areas we see this coming up with is SciFinder, which you might be familiar with at your institution that supports chemistry. And SciFinder actually has a separate pricing model for incubators, so for these research groups um, that are sponsored by your university but are kind of going into a business opportunity, becoming a startup, we have a separate pricing model for that. That is not going to be included within your academic license. Um, and in many cases, that pricing model will be out of uh, affordability for that startup. So um, I think it's important for us to realize that we have a new situation on our campuses um, that might really put our authorized user's definition at risk, and we might really be doing some commercial use of our, of our databases that we did not intend, and that is against our license agreements. And I think this is an area that we really need to work on um, and see if we can create some standard language that, like, that publishers and vendors would accept. Um, similarly, we're seeing a lot of issues with accessibility compliance, and one of the major questions we have is given the lawsuits that we're seeing, um, and well, I guess there's also the ethical imperative, um, but to what extent are our library databases required to be compliant with federal standards, state standards, system standards, or your institutional standards for accessibility? Right, so we're talking about Section 508 federally, and then your state or your system or your institution might have its own um, accessibility compliance um, standards. An interesting site to look at is the Higher Education Litigation Timeline created by California State University San Marcos. And there's two cases that touch on libraries. The first is uh, UC Berkeley with um, the disability rights advocates. And in that, in that lawsuit, a couple of things came out that could affect licensing. Um, one is that uh, the, all the online catalogs and the websites within the university's the library's control had to be looked at for accessibility. And um, I talked to someone at UC Berkeley and asked them a little bit about the licensing end of that and if there's a requirement then to require all licensed databases to meet accessibility standards. And they said they were able to negotiate with the group, um, arguing that there are so many vendors that provide a niche service to a group of researchers. They're the only vendor um, that provides that information. And they may not have the ability to be accessibility compliant in the way that um, the university would need them to be. So they struck a compromise, and the compromise was that the library would use reasonable best efforts to persuade outside third parties to implement the changes necessary. So the implication there is not that you would have a requirement in your license agreement, but that you would, if, if something was not compliant, was not accessible, that you would persuade them to become accessible. And then Penn State um, had a case with the National Federation for the Blind in 2012, and that had some specific, um, specific requirements that came out of that for the library and for the library website, including that the university shall implement a search engine that is accessible according to uh, W3C, 
and that can search across all library collections, including but not limited to e-journals, databases, and e-books. So if the search engine has to be accessible to search across all of those, what about the individual collections themselves? What about eBrary? You know, what about Springer website and their, and their e-journal? So it definitely poses that question. And as a result, a lot of university libraries have really started looking at whether or not it's feasible to require their, their database vendors to provide information about accessibility and for each database to be compliant. And a really interesting presentation happened this year at ERNL uh, 2014 about accessibility. And I really want to highlight the, the presentation from Erin Finnerty of Temple, which is in Pennsylvania, which um, really took a look at what was going on and, and wondered if, could they make it so that every time you renew a database, they had to get a form that said if, whether or not the database was accessible, test it, track it, and do a lot of work. So um, the amount of work that Erin Finnerty did to try to meet these standards and the amount of workflow changes she made um, is fascinating. And so she's a really interesting person to talk to about accessibility compliance. And some of the interesting issues we see when we start including accessibility compliance in our licenses is that they put obligations on the library, not just the vendor. So when you say that something has to comply with an ADA or with W3C, you're also kind of inferring you're going to test it. Otherwise, there's no peace. There's no accountability. Um, and the other thing you might see is that you would be requesting what's called a VTAT form from the vendor. It's very common to see this in, in licensing language. And if you're not familiar with the VPAT form, it, it, it is a federal form. It's used by federal contractors or by the government to, to review federal contractors. And there is a section of the form for web-based information. And so I have a, a screenshot of it on the screen here. And so you can see that a vendor would have to fill out all the different ways that it meets or doesn't meet these requirements and to what extent it meets or doesn't meet these requirements. Um, so if you're requesting a VPAT form, presumably you're going to review that VPAT form and you're going to test it. So it's important to realize the implications of putting that kind of language in your license agreements. Um, are you going to test it? How are you going to make sure that it's actually compliant? Most vendors will tell you that they're accessi accessibility compliant, but when you test, they're not. So what are you going to do there? Um, our institution is trying to adapt language. Uh, I benchmarked, I look around the state. Um, I'm choosing to adapt language from UT Austin, um, which basically says um, that the licensor will uh, promise to comply with, in our case, a state law listing requirements for, for electronic information resources, that if the licensor realizes, if we tell them that that website doesn't work or the product doesn't work, they will either fix it or they'll replace it. And if they are unable to do so, they will refund us. Now, this is my, <laughs> this is my draft license, uh, license language, but I am not at the point where I feel I can actually put it in or negotiate for it because I still don't know how I would test functional requirements. We don't have the staff. We don't have that infrastructure. Um, I like this language, but I'm not sure practically if I can really do that. And I haven't really tested it to see um, how it would work. So I think there's a lot of questions that remain with accessibility. Do you require accessibility for all of your resources? Um, if you put accessibility clauses in your licenses, are you going to test it? And some software people use to test it are um, the compliance sheriff, or they might run it through JAWS to see how it goes. Um, if you're going to do that, are you going to keep track of those that aren't compliant? Are you going to keep track of whether or not something is, uh, a vendor is improving their resources? So I think there's a lot of questions if we decide to include accessibility in our license, which I think is important. I think we need to do that, but we need to think about the consequences of doing that. Um, and my other concern here is that something like a VPAT, which is basic, it's federal, I don't understand why our primary library vendors don't seem to have one on hand. And I feel like we could do a better job as a library community just demanding that EBSCO, ProQuest, Scale, they have a VPAT. It's on their website. It's updated. And you can download it for the interface that you're licensing. That shouldn't be something that's so hard to get. I think that can really help us um, in the long run. So accessibility, still an issue. There's language there, but it has consequences for the library. Um, another area where we're seeing issues is with authorized users. And so 
right now, most of our license agreements for authorized users and the standard terms we see in model licenses don't allow for alumni access. But we're seeing increasing pressures from our alumni and development offices to allow for alumni access. The other issue you might discover, and it would be interesting if you went to your IT department and asked, is how long after graduating do your students actually keep their login for the, for the university? You might be surprised at the answer. In some cases, those who have graduated who are not registered for any more classes will keep their login for three months four months. If that's the case, and they know about it, and they can go back to your EBSCO databases, um, you're in violation of your license agreement. So is there language we can use in our authorized user sections to allow for that case, that the IT division doesn't shut that off and we can't shut it off for whatever reason? Um, so you can cover, cover that instance if it happens. That's very interesting. The other issue we're seeing is, is new vendors who have never worked with libraries before and are very scared about how their content could be used um, so that they would lose money. So especially in the applied health field, um, you often have faculty members who have dual positions. They might work at your library, but they might also work at a hospital or, or a health organization. Um, and you might see language that says, in a very convoluted way, that the researcher cannot use that database when they're at the other location. They cannot proxy in, they cannot. They're not allowed to use it if they're at their other place of employment or for or supporting their other work. So this actually has come up in, in my case, and I'm wondering if this is something that we need to talk a little bit more as a community to see if there's good standard language. I developed something, um, you'll see on the right there, and you can study this later, you can have the slides, but I don't love it. But the idea is how can we make it clear in the license agreement that it's okay for us to limit use um, just for research purposes at our institution? And then you know, share that publicly when we link to the resource. Um, I think this is just a sample case of these vendors who we're seeing new to the library market, new to the university market, who are very scared about losing um, any kind of business um, on the commercial side. Um, similarly, uh, we're licensing a lot more data sets that don't come on CD. These are from companies that usually work with other businesses, and you download the data from a website, and you don't store it on a CD. At the same time, they still have clauses in their licenses about destroying everything um, that you might have printed out from the product. As a CD, okay, you can destroy a CD or you can send back a CD, but if we're downloading information, we have users downloading and creating spreadsheets, we can't really agree to clauses that says we're gonna destroy everything. What are we gonna do? We're we gonna contact everybody and say you need to look through your computer and destroy all your spreadsheets? And what about people who graduated or people who moved on to other universities? It's just, it's not realistic. And so we need to start looking at those clauses when we're, we're, we're negotiating for data and add disclaimers. Um, I don't love this disclaimer that I've been using. I wish I could figure out a better one. Um, but I really want to talk about in that disclaimer that there's a limitation to what we're able to do in terms of destroying uh, data. We'll make reasonable um, efforts to do so, but people might have left, and there's a limit to what we're able to do. So I also think that's an area in our model licenses we don't really have great language for, and it's developing, especially as we move into more of a web-based data environment. We're also licensing a lot more images. And what we found as we started licensing these images is that our marketing department wants to use the images in their materials, or even our, our library promotions team wants to use the images from the databases in emails. Um, and yet the license language in these image databases doesn't really specify if you can do that. And so I think that there's a, a place for developing some standard language for how you might be able to use images that you get in these image databases. For instance, specifying websites, emails, news publications, um, use, um, with the underlying understanding that whatever you're doing isn't to sell something, it's to promote a, something that's, that's free. And so I think we can really strengthen this language, make it a little bit better and a little bit more sustainable throughout time. And I think this could be something that we might want to have available as a community together 
if we're licensing image databases. We're also seeing the situation where if you're, you might get into the world of self-hosting streaming files, so not going through Alexander Street Press, um, but actually purchasing the streaming file. It might be um, the file itself, or you might get the DVD and then purchase the rights really to, to um, extract the file from the DVD so that's a streaming file. A lot of people think that we automatically have the right to make a backup of that file. Um, but it is not true. If you go into um, 108C of, of, the, of the copyright section of the U.S. Code, you'll see that that's not what it says. It doesn't say you can just go ahead and make a copy. It says that if something is deteriorating, um, and you, then you have to make a reasonable effort to locate a copy at a fair price. That's what it says. It doesn't say go ahead and make a backup copy as soon as you buy it. So you can't rely on that, and you might notice that the language you get in your license um, prevents you from making a backup copy. Now, NERL, which again was updated pretty recently in 2012, does have some terms for that that I'd like to draw your attention to. Um, but you might not be able to use those terms as written. I did create an alternative that I've had some, some luck with that really just says we can at least archive a copy um, if the original copy that we're using or a used copy doesn't work. But one thing that you might start learning is that if you do buy a DVD with the ability to extract a file, if you decide you're going to extract the file in AVI format, and then a couple years down the road you want to do MP4, the license will actually specify if you're going to change formats, you need to buy the DVD again. And I'm seeing that in 80% of the cases where this is coming across my desk. So I really feel like we really need some good language here. We need to work together as a community to not let that language go without saying something about it. Um, and maybe tighten up the NER license, uh, license language or what we're about to see in live license. Um, we're also seeing vendors and publishers trying to define reasonable amounts for printing or for sharing. Um, they're very, very hesitant to use the word fair use. They don't like it. So they come up with something like this. And this came up in a collection of like thousands of journals. So when you look at this and you say, okay, it's not more than 10% of the license, of the content contained in licensed materials, you're wondering, is it 10% of all of the thousands of journals? Is it 10% of the article? Is it 10% of the journal? That's just, it's not useful, it's not meaningful, it's basically ridiculous. And so this is what I'm seeing in license agreements as, as a default coming from vendors and publishers. So I'm trying to work with it and create alternate language um, about reasonable use. I try to refer to, to the four uh, fair use factor analysis. Um, However, it's, I feel like it, it's a red flag. Every time you use fair use, I feel like we're in a culture right now where publishers and vendors get really scared that that means you're going to exploit them in some terrible way, and they won't agree to it. They don't know what it means. So I, I think this is an area in our model licenses where we don't really have great language. I think that we're not really where we need to be with it, and we probably need to work a little bit more to figure out if there's anything we can do um, that would work. We're also starting to, um, I would say, even though we're starting to see data on CD, on web, web-based sites, we're still actually licensing software and data on CDs, on CD-ROMs. Those licenses are still coming to my desk. And as you know, you often want to network these across computers or maybe to other sites on your campus. Um, and a lot of times these licenses are, are very harsh about networking. And even if you can get networking allowed, um, they're very specific about how you can network. IT divisions at universities are now looking into um, cloud platform distribution. So they would take your CD, it would, all the content would be uploaded to a third party cloud host, and then it would be distributed back down to your network. That requires language, and I, I've actually had to use this four times in the past two years. Um, so I feel, again, this is where our model licenses are pretty weak. We certainly don't have model licenses that talk a lot about CD-ROMs and software, and that could be why. But I feel like um, if I'm coming across it, there's a really good chance someone else might come across it, too. And this language probably can be tightened and shared and used to allow for 
um, a cloud platform distribution of, uh, of software. Um, of course, we all still have this issue of, of trying to cling on to a single site definition, especially if you have satellite campuses. Um, a lot of us do. We'll have a site up north or south or somewhere else in the city or in a different city um, to accommodate people who live in a different area. Um, I feel like our model licenses need to be tightened up in this area and our preferred language should be tightened up so that single site definition accounts for the fact that you're geographically different. There's geographically different campuses, but there's one administration, there's one IP range, and there's not a separate FTE count. There's also not a separate graduation count. Um, it's the same administration. There's no separate provost or separate university president. Um, it's, just a, it's just a different site, just a different building. And so I think that we really need to have some better language there for defining what a single site is, allowing for two geographic locations, but understanding that it's really just one university or one campus. Um, finally, at ERNL 2013, we came across the idea of maybe adding more teeth to our completeness of content clauses. And by that I mean, when we license digital archives, back files of, of journals, um, oftentimes you might find that it's not all there. All that content you paid for isn't all there. The title list is wrong, the bot is wrong. So Dan Conkery in his keynote um, at ERNL in 2013 talked about maybe we should put in our licenses, we're only going to pay for half up front, and then we're going to test completeness of content. We're going to make sure it's all there, and then you can get the other half of the payment. Um, I love that idea. However, I tried that idea and it did not work. So I think we, we really need to look at what's not working, what the limits of our licenses are, where we could compromise and create license, language that serves us at least a little bit and where we might need to give up. So again, those areas, some of which I've touched on, are making backup copies of streaming files, um, having problems there, this idea of only paying for half of a digital back file, testing for completeness of content, and then paying for the other half doesn't seem to work. Uh, perpetual access is a perpetual problem. Um, trying to require a publisher to participate in portico and locks often doesn't work. They say they'll only do so at their discretion. They might not even name locks or portico. They have a lot of conditions around it. Um, in many cases, vendors and publishers are refusing to include any kind of blanket fair use permissions. They're afraid of it, they don't like it. Um, some libraries and some of the model licenses have stated that if a click-through agreement or an end-user license agreement is changed or before it is changed, it needs to go through you. Uh, vendors don't agree to that. That doesn't work for them. It doesn't make sense for them to get your approval to change the end-user agreement. So I think we need to be realistic there and then just make our license agreement stronger so that it doesn't matter if that end-user license agreement for click-through changes. Um, we just make sure that it's stated in our license, that our license um, takes priority over the end-user license agreement, so it doesn't matter if it changes. Um, there's been some discussion recently about whether or not we could require in our licenses that the vendor or publisher participates in all discovery services. Like, let's make them do it in our licenses. Um, I, that's not going to work. I don't think that's been successful. Um, I don't think that they're going to agree to that at all. I think that's a, a limitation of our license. We have to manage our expectations about what our licenses can do. And I know that uh, there's also the discussion of trying to, especially when negotiating with a publisher, trying to say, listen, um, all of our researchers at our institution, if they publish in one of your journals, they'll be able to deposit into our institutional repository. And trying to get that right into the site license um, to kind of override any individual copyright agreements that your researchers might make with the publisher. That's not really working either, and I'm not sure that we can really expect our licenses to do that. So when we look at new model licenses or we look at language, we need to realize there's a limit to what they're going to be able to do, and we might not be able to solve all of the problems of our industry in our licenses. Um, at the end of the day, I think we need to work together. And I think we need more of a community. And I think it because I saw something like this. 
where authorized users have to have legitimate educational purposes, um, they have to be training for mental health profession and in a class, and the library has to encourage the users to, to view the content in a private environment, out of sight, where no one else could hear. That's ridiculous, that's ridiculous, right? I felt like when I went to that vendor and said, that's ridiculous, they were pretty clear. They said, no one else told me that was ridiculous. So I felt like I was all alone. And I, I thought it was sad that there wasn't more of a, a community just all standing together and saying, no, that's not gonna work. None of us are gonna license that. That's ridiculous. And so at the end of my presentation here, I just want to argue that we need to stop licensing in silos. We're creating these model licenses, we're trying to create terms, some of which might need to be institutional specific, but I think we can better share what's not working. We can share the new exceptional bizarre clauses we've had to create with new formats and, and new vendors. Um, and I think we can better share these sticky issues with each other. Um, I also think we can also better leverage our community power to say no to these crazy licensing terms. I'm not sure if live license or the live license list serve is where we can do that as effectively as maybe we need to. I feel like we need another place. I don't know what that would look like. I don't know if it's another group. I don't know if it's, um, if it's a wiki. I don't know what it would be, but I feel like we need a little bit more of a formal community, a place for librarians who license to say, hey, I got this, what should I do? And then if a group comes up with some great language, that that language is available for others to use and adapt. Um, so this is the question I really want to try to answer. And so if you're interested in also answering that question and trying to come up with a way for us to be a better licensing community, please email me and we'll start that conversation together. Maybe we'll talk at basic or maybe we can set up some phone calls. Um, but I'm serious. I really think that we need a better community uh, for licensing. Um, so um, before we go on, I just want to point out some, some NASIG presentations um, that are happening about licensing. There's Claire's pre-conference on Wednesday. And then on Saturday, Eric and Jane from Texas A&M are going to be talking about their licensing. They use a checklist method, so if you're interested in that, um, I encourage you to go to that. And then Shannon Regan from uh, Mercer is also talking about her approaches to licensing and how she kind of built her competencies. I think that's going to be a really good presentation um, on Saturday afternoon. So there we go. That's the end of my presentation, and now I'm ready to accept your questions. Well, so far, uh, this is Todd again, and no one has input any questions into the Q&A box that I've seen. Uh, someone did send a message asking if your slides were going to be made available after this. Yes, okay. I can do whatever, however we need to do it, absolutely. There's a lot of text there, so yeah. yeah. Uh, so whenever I send out the link to the recording, I will attach uh, Leanne's uh, slide so that everyone who gets a copy of the recording will also get a copy of uh, the slide. All right, uh, here's a question. A uh, well, part of the question <laughs> uh, from Ree Seymour Green started asking when a product has an EULA, do you also RIT and then it cut off? So I'm not sure what her whole question was. I will say that when a product has an EULA, um, if I discover it, I do put something in the license that says, in the case of there being a click through, um, the site license uh, takes priority and supersedes it. Um, and I've had best of luck with that. As soon as I took out the clause that said we had to see changes to the, to, to the click-through, um, I was able to get that through. So they can have click-throughs all they want, but the site license reigns. Yeah, uh, she finished your question asking if you require a separate written agreement. No. Okay. Um, I am not seeing any more questions coming in, so, and we are right at time. So if you do have any, oh, there one came up. What are your things about non-disclosure clauses in the license? In some cases, um, I know there's been a big deal about this as a community, um, about our rights to share. Um, in some cases, as a state institution, you can't have a non-disclosure. Um, you might have to share for um, 
for reasons with your ask to share, so we do put in that clause. Um, I think there's some really good points about if we don't share how much we're paying and what's going on, then we don't have, we lack a lot of transparency. Um, but I also see the vendor's perspective where they're, they're a business and they're trying to protect um, sometimes their business model and how they've managed to be competitive. I think I, think I see both sides, so I'd really like to have a talk with someone more about it. Okay, and we have one last question. Have you had any success negotiating for alumni access? Yes, where I've had success in negotiating for alumni access is with career services databases. The companies that usually work with career services offices fully expect their databases to be used by alumni. It's bizarre. It's like, of course alumni can use it. Um, that's where I've had success. With our primary library vendors, I have not. They want um, a separate payment or a step-up payment for that. All right. Well, we are at time. If you have any more questions for Leanne, please go ahead and email her about that. And if you have any ideas about uh, better ways to coordinate contracting, also please uh, email her. Thank you, Leanne, for uh, for presenting today. Really appreciate it. Got lots of messages saying it was very helpful Great. and very informative. Um, just want to, before we end, just again say we do have some more upcoming webinars. A joint NASIC NISA webinar, playing the numbers, best practices in acquiring, interpreting, and applying usage statistics on May 21st. Again, that is hosted by NISO. So if you're interested, please go ahead and uh, register at the NISA website. Uh, there'll be three different speakers. Peter Shepard will be talking about counter four. Oliver Pesh will be talking about integrating counter statistics. And Jill Emery will be talking about usage uh, in library specifically. We also have two other NASIC webinars uh, coming up in September, November, uh, from record bound to boundless, Ferber linked data and new possibilities for serials cataloging, and DIY ERM for the small library. And more information about those will be forthcoming. Uh, we will be sending out a link to the recording of this presentation shortly, along with the slides from Leanne's presentation. And again, when you log off, please take a few minutes to fill out the SurveyMonkey survey to let us know how we did. With that, I'd like to thank you all again for registering and attending on behalf of the CEC, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.